rolling here with everything. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well and can see the video. Um, I see there's quite a few people on, but I just want to make sure we can we can hear that. So if anything comes up, see if you can shoot me a message that uh, that shows it's not working. Um, but regardless, um, I want to thank you guys all for joining this um, this little St. Mark's Hospital Healthy Conversations chat um, on bone and joint health. My name is Clinton Lackis. Um, I'm a physical therapist here at St. Mark's Hospital. Um, currently working in the most of the time in the outpatient um, rehab uh, setting. Um, working as a physical therapist, but I also cover some shifts on the hospital side of things. So um, really kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, my training specifically, I'm originally from uh, Nebraska, where I did my undergraduate and PT school training between Lincoln and Omaha. Um, and I've been out here at St. Mark's Hospital for about two years now. So, so kind of getting the feeling for the city and the valley and, and everything that comes with it. So, so let's dive on in and jump on some, obje ob some objectives here. Um, so the first objective I have is that I want to discuss and, uh, and have us understand why bone and joint health are important to us. Um, secondly, I want to discuss the prevalence of poor bone health um, and risk factors that can lead to osteoporosis. Um, thirdly, I want to discuss total joint replacement prevalence secondary to not maintaining our, our joint health. Um, fourth, I want to discuss what we can do to promote bone and joint health. Um, and the fifth one kind of going along with number four is we're going to review a daily maintenance exercise program um, to kind of promote the, the bone and joint health. So we'll start here and what exactly is bone health? Um, so good bone health means that our bodies have the ability to manage and adapt to the stresses placed on them without resulting in fractures or additional bodily, bodily injury. Um, and basically what this is saying is that as we contract a muscle, as we stand up to do a movement, as we, you know, take off to, to go for a jog or something that our, our bones have the capacity to handle the stresses that are asked of them um, without resulting in a fracture, which then could result in additional bodily injury. Now, with that being said, we could have the best bone health in the world. However, if we are subjected to um, excessive forces such as trauma, you know, car accidents, um, skiing accidents, those high impact traumas, we can still get bone fractures. You could just because you have great bone health doesn't mean that you're, you know, immune from bone fractures. Um, so that's something that I want. I wanted to make sure we were aware of. Um, so then we'll jump into what is joint health. Okay. Now, this is kind of a long and wordy definition, but I'll kind of break it down. But the definition definition is, is good joint health means that the joint is able to maintain its full range of motion and complete functional mobility with correct mechanics to prevent damage to their surrounding structures. And I kind of listed a couple structures here because joints have a lot going on with them. They're surrounded by muscles that help move the joint. They're surrounded by ligaments that attach the muscles to the bones um, or sorry, attach bones to bones and provide some stability. Um, they have cartilage. They have arteries, vein, veins, stuff like that, nerves, and as well as bones. So there's really a lot that goes into joints. Um, and basically what that definition is saying is that our joint is moving with correct mechanics that allow it to complete the task we ask of it um, without pain, without catching, without anything that's throwing off the, the, its ability to move as, it, as it's needed. Um, and my little bullets at the bottom, even the smallest miscues in the joints and mechanics can result in injury. Okay, so it doesn't take a whole lot to to irritate a joint and cause additional um, additional injury, additional pain, um, stuff like that. <clears throat> so we're going to jump back to bone health. So why is it important to maintain our bone health? Well, the National National Osteoporosis Foundation reported that in 2018, approximately 10.2 million adults in the United States had osteoporosis with an additional 43.4 uh, yeah, million having low bone mass. So, you know, we're looking at about 53 million adults who have some sort of bone compromise, okay? Um, and when you break that down into percentage, it ends up being about 16% of the population in the United States. So not a huge number, but when you look at this number in regards of millions of people, it is a rather large amount that have some sort of bone compromise. Um, and that little bullet point at the bottom, you know, we, we are at risk of increased bone fractures, um, whether that be a full on fracture or a stress fracture, we're just at an increased risk of those things if we don't have adequate bone health, okay? 
So, and here's just some, some osteoporosis fracture facts, okay? So, one in two women over the age of 50 will experience an osteoporosis-related fracture in her life. And that's a pretty, a, a pretty crazy stat. One in two women over the age of 50. Now, that's not always going to be your, your traumatic hip fracture or femur fracture or a massive bone fracture. It can be as simple as a, a, a little fall at home that results in a fracture in a small bone in the hand. Um, a fracture of the, of a rib, something like that, something not super intense, but enough that uh, osteoporosis has compromised the bone stability. Um, that second point, so verte vertebral and spinal fractures are the most common fractures caused by osteoporosis. And this in itself is a little scary as well. Um, when you think about what the vertebrae um, and the spine are, you know, are encapsulating, it's all of your nerves, it's your spinal cord, it's, it's what controls your movements to your arms and legs. Um, and if we're getting some some weakness in those bones around those structures, it is it is rather scary to to think about a fracture there. Um, and these vertebral and spinal fractures, I've seen them in patients happen with as little with as little um, trauma as simply sitting down in a chair or a, a heavy sneeze. Um, sometimes the bones can become compromised enough that even even light intensity stuff like that can cause a fracture. So. Um, kind of crazy to think about there. Um, and then this last bullet point, we're talking about hip fractures. Okay. We see a lot of hip fractures here in the hospital. Um, and with that, one out of every five patients needs care, additional care in, say, a nursing home following this. Um, and I would almost say that that number, one in five, is actually low given what we see. Um, the big problem with these hip fractures is that depending where the hip fracture is at, whether it's in the pelvis, whether it's in the um, actual femur uh, bone itself, some of these patients are required to non weight bear on this injured side for an extended period of time, up to six weeks. Um, and having somebody who is um, a little bit older and now they can only walk, put weight on one leg, it can be very challenging them, for them to even complete their, their simple daily tasks like getting in and out of their home up and down stairs, in and out of a bathtub, stuff like that. So fractures are a very serious thing that we we don't we do not take lightly for sure. So with osteoporosis and, and you know the bone health, um, there's some changeable and unchangeable risk factors. Um, and these unchangeable ones we're gonna go through first. Um, I want you to think of them more as they're unchangeable. So there's nothing we can directly do. But what we can do is we can keep an eye on it and we can, you know, make sure that we're looking at we're being our own best advocate um, and, and, you know, staying on top of things if we think something's not right. Um, so the first unchangeable one is sex. Um, so women develop osteoporosis much more frequently than men. Um, and then as well as age, as we age, our risk of osteoporosis increases. Um, women tend to lose their bone mass at an earlier age um, compared to males, and that's uh, mostly due to horm hormonal changes. Um, and then women, women above 50 um, have a four times higher rate of osteoporosis um, than males. So definitely there's a, there's a predominant side there. Um, race, people um, of wider Asian descent have increased risk if you have a family history of it. That's also uh, something to keep an eye on. And then your body frame size. So small body frames um, tend to have higher rates of osteoporosis, osteoporosis just to their less overall bone mass and bone structure. So then we'll jump to our changeable risk factors for osteoporosis. Um, so first of all, we'll start with dietary factors. So things like low calcium in intake, eating disorders, caffeine consumption, um, history of gastrointestinal surgery, um, those increase your chances of osteoporosis. Um, I did a little research into the caffeine consumption and it's, it's somewhat inconsistent on what you find. Um, it seems like if you are excessively complete, uh, intaking caffeine, like I think it said more than three or four cups a day um, is when you, you could potentially start seeing some side effects to that. So it's not like you're your daily morning cup of coffee is a huge thing, but it is something that they've associated with osteoporosis. Um, and then the gastrointestinal surgeries, um, what we worry about with that is anytime that we've uh, compromised the gastrointestinal tract, we've then lessened the body's ability to uptake nutrients, um, which can result in uh, weaker bones just because there's less nutrients to restore the, the bones strength. Um, sedentary lifestyle is another uh, risk factor. 
um, increased time spent sitting results in an increase in osteoporosis frequency. And with this one, there's something interesting. Um, it's more of a uh, physiologic process. It's called the, it's called Wolf's Law. And basically, what Wolf's Law is is it says that our bones will react to the forces applied on them by the muscles. So it's one of those things. If you use something a lot, it's going to get stronger. So as the bones or as the muscles pull on the bones, the bones naturally over time will lay down increased um, stability, increased bone mass, increased structure to accept that amount of stress, okay? Um, but at the same time, with a sedentary lifestyle, it's kind of the, if you don't use it, you lose it type principle, okay? If we're not putting that extra stress on the bone, the bone has no reason to build up more strength um, and will actually start to break down some of that strength and we become we become weaker. And then the last two are kind of your substance abuse things. So excessive alcohol consumption, um, you know, more than two drinks a day for male, one drink for, for females is associated with increasing the risk, um, and then tobacco use, um, and that's smokeless or um, cigarettes or, or smoking tobacco can increase the risk of osteoporosis. So now we'll jump into kind of the, why is maintaining the joint health important? important. Um, so the CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control, reports that one in four adults in the United States with arthritis, so about 15 million people, report experiencing severe joint pain related to their joint arthritis. Um, and nearly half of adults with arthritis will then have persistent pain. And this is something that, that um, as a physical therapist, is, is I feel like this number, again, is undershooting what's actually going on. Um, I would say probably 50% or more of the patients that we see in physical therapy are referred to us with a strict diagnosis of joint pain. Um, that can be shoulder joint, that can be hip joint, knee, wrist, ankle, you know, really any of them can be a, a referral source for us. So joint pain is extremely, extremely common um, and is something that we quite frequently, you know, get to treat um, as, as therapists. So kind of went through a lot there here early on, and I just had a little slide here. Any questions or comments um, so far? And have you experienced any of the issues that, uh, that I've mentioned thus far? All right, I guess the, this also, the silence I'll assume it means we're we're good to keep cooking. Um, if, if you guys have any questions or concerns at any point along this along this presentation, just don't hesitate to to speak up and um, speak up and throw them at me. So that said, we'll keep rolling on here. So um, this next part kind of kind of talks about if we haven't maintained our joints, okay? And a lot of times, what people immediately resort to when when they have a, a sore joint or a painful joint is that they go to a an orthopedic surgeon and uh, they proceed with a joint replacement. Um, and which is, uh, our, our physicians have come such a long way in joint replacements. People are doing phenomenal with joint replacements. Um, it's just, they are so prevalent now and that, you know, we wanna see if we can potentially avoid these, these kind of massive surgeries. Um, so just in regards to the joint replacement facts, um, so total joint replacements are currently, they currently rank number three in the US for most completed surgeries. And these are only following um, surgeries for, for cataracts in the eyes, as well as C-sections for, for del delivering children. Um, so kind of crazy to think it's the number three surgery in the US um, is, just, is just getting our joints replaced. Um, and an estimated 720,000 knee replacements and 330 hip replacements are completed each year. So pretty pretty high numbers of, uh, of, rep of joint replacements are being completed. Now, on average, a total joint replacement will cost anywhere from sixteen and a half thousand dollars to thirty three thousand dollars. Now, this obviously, from a from a financial standpoint, this is an all patient cost. Obviously, there's some insurance help there, but just looking at the total cost in general, if we're to take this sixteen and a half thousand and take it times the 720,000 um, knee replacements, and that's taking the low end of the, of the cost, keep in mind. 
that's an that's an annual cost of twelve billion dollars, um, potentially up to twenty four billion dollars in just knee replacements. If you if if they end up costing the the thirty three thousand, um, so pretty crazy number of of dollars are spent each year on on these joint replacements. And as a physical therapist, you know we we like to go into it as an approach with patients from a conservative standpoint, where we you know, we asked them, let, let's see if we can give it, you know, six weeks of physical therapy of, of movement based interventions and see what we can do to that joint to, uh, to maybe keep you off the operating table and keep you getting that joint replaced. So, pretty, pretty crazy numbers there in regards to amount and, and cost. Um, and this slide I, I threw in here, because I thought it was kind of inter interesting that the numbers kind of break it down as to, as to how many or as to what percentage of people have had. A, a knee and a hip replacement, um, depending on their age. And keep in mind that this study was also done in 2010. So this is an 11 year old study and I would, I would anticipate that the numbers are, are you know, quite a few percentage different. Um, but I also like this slide because it actually gives you an x-ray of what a knee and a hip replacement look like. Um, so on that left on that left graph there, um, shows the knee replacement and you can see where they've taken off the, the, the top of the tibia, which is the bottom bone. They have buzzed off the end of the femur, which is the top bone um, and have put basically 2 congruent smooth surfaces there. And those are now free to move on top of each other with significantly less pain. Um, and then on the right picture there, we have a hip replacement. Um, hip replacement is a little bit more in, involved. They have to, the, the, it's almost like a, a ball sitting in a cup there at the top. And with the hip replacement, they actually have to ground out the, the cup part of it because normally there's some buildup of bone in there. Um, so they'll grind that out. They'll put in a nice smooth um, new cup in there. And then they'll put in the femur prosthetic part, which is kind of that hook looking thing going down to the bottom of the picture. And it has a ball on top of it. And that basically allows for there to have smooth congruent um, movement within the hip joint there. So kind of interesting just to see what, you know, what an actual knee and a hip replacement look like. Uh, this graph here is just basically um, a line graph showing of what that last slide showed, showing that females tend to have more uh, of both. They're, they have a higher rate of knee and hip replacement with knees being the most frequent. Okay. So kind of now we'll jump into the, so, so what about it? What can we do about it um, phase of this? Um, and so the first one is maintaining a healthy diet. And this really comes into play in regards to our bone health. Um, second thing we can do is avoid the, uh, avoid substance abuse. You know, that's the, like we talked about the alcohol, um, tobacco, stuff like that, as they can have an effect on bone health. Um, we want to include physical activity in our daily routine and when we, we want to avoid um, a sedentary lifestyle. So we'll jump into these a little bit more. So maintaining a healthy diet. The biggest thing with bone health that we can do is we can include plenty of calcium in our diet. Okay, so these, these first two bullet points here, I kind of break down the numbers. Um, and what the takeaway is, is that um, for women, we, especially as they get above the age of 51, um, that number increases from 1,000 milligrams a day to 1,200 milligrams a day. Um, and for men, that number jumps up once we reach the age of 70. Um, <clears throat> and why that's important, I just want to point out again that women need more calcium just because of those hormonal changes that happen. They're more, more susceptible to osteoporosis. Um, and some good sources of calcium here I, I wrote down at the bottom. So your dairy, pro dairy products are obviously... Um, very useful for calcium, almonds, broccoli, kale. Kale is actually one of the best foods um, for calcium. And the reason that is, in regards to its total amount of calcium, it has less than dairy products. However, <clears throat> its bioavailability or the body's ability to uptake the calcium is a lot higher in kale versus dairy products. So um, kale is actually a very, very good um, source of calcium. Um, salmon with bones, sardines, and soy products such as tofu are also very great. Um, and just as a reference point, um, when you think about dairy products, so on average, an eight ounce glass of milk is going to contain about 300 milligrams of calcium. However, it only has about 30% bioavailability. So we're taking in roughly 100 milligrams of calcium with every eight ounces um, 
with every eight ounces of same milk that we drink. So just a just a reference point there. Let's see. Okay, and then next thing is vitamin D. So what vitamin D does, vitamin D, um, its main role and really only role in the bottle body is to help in the absorption of calcium. If we don't have vitamin D, we can't uptake calcium. So um, recommended daily intake, I wrote that on here. Now, I'm not super worried about the, um, the actual numbers here. I just wanted to point out that as we get older, we actually need more vitamin D, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll say why that's important when I get to the next slide here. Um, and then sources of vitamin D, um, oily fish such as salmon, trout, white fish, and tuna, um, mushrooms, eggs, fortified foods such as milk and cereals. Um, and then the last big one there is the is sunlight. So vitamin D is known as our um, as our sunlight vitamin. Um, and I'll forward on to here. And I apologize. I think I had a question pop up there. I I can't. Could you ask that again? I, it kind of disappeared here from my screen. Oh, maybe, well, if you can, can you tell us what types of calcium supplements are best? Um, if if I'm going to be honest on on the supplements, I don't have a great a great answer on on specific um, on specific types of supplements. Okay, and does low bone density mean low calcium as well? Um, does low bone density mean low calcium as well? I would say not necessarily, but the two are definitely correlated. So if you have low calcium, your body isn't going to have that amount of nutrients to strengthen up the bone and, and increase the bone density. So, and again, it's not purely the calcium that's going to make the bone strong. It just is one of the things that the body needs to have strong bones, okay? Um, so I'm not gonna say that one is directly the cause of the other, um, but they definitely correlate to each other. Um, and then Kim, in regards to your question on which calcium supplements are best, um, that would be a question that would really be best targeted towards a dietitian. Um, I don't have that exact information, nor have I uh, explored really which supplements are superior to others. Um, so that would be a question to to shoot at your at your dietitian. Um, and then, so going back to what I said, so sunlight. Sunlight is the you know is the is where we get vitamin D from. It's absorbed through our skin. Okay. Um, and some tips to optimize the amount of vitamin D you get um, is you want to shoot for about 10 to 30 minutes of sunlight a day. Um, and you want that to be over the midday hours, okay? That's when the sun's at its highest um, highest peak. That's when you get the best vitamin D from the sun. Um, as well as a little fact, so darker skin may need increased time to, to get the amount of vitamin D as well as as we age, we actually became, become less efficient at making vitamin D. So that's where I go back to that last slide where I talked about the numbers. Um, and you notice that as we get above 70, we actually need um, we actually need more intake of vitamin D. Um, and so we also know that we we make it less efficiency as we age. So it actually takes more time to get the the more needed amount of vitamin vitamin D that we need as we age. And then this last little this last little line here: understand that too much sunlight can also be dangerous. I'm not saying that we need to go sit outside for for eight hours a day and just absolutely, um, am I resorting to vitamin D3? Um, I guess I'm just regarding to um, referring to vitamin D in general. I think there's a couple different vitamin Ds, but I guess I'm just referring to vitamin D um, in general. And again, I apologize in regards to the actual, um, you know, which ones are best, which ones are most important. Um, a lot of that would be m more targeted towards a, uh, a dietitian that focuses more on that can break down more what your levels are. Um, all right, so then moving on to the next one. So we kind of talked about the important things with diet. Um, now we'll go into physical activity, okay? And this is kind of where we, we come into play as physical therapists. 
Um, and this is directly from the American College of Rheumatology. Um, exercise and arthritis can and should coexist. People with ar arthritis who exercise regularly have less pain, more energy, improved sleep, and better day-to-day -day function. Um, and this is commonly a, a battle that we have to have with patients. Um, they come in with a sore joint. Um, they've been told by their doctor that, well, I have arthritis in my knee, and the only thing that's going to work is that I have to, it's, it's going to need replaced down the road. Um, when, and when in reality, we found that movement is kind of the best thing for um, a sore joint. Um, it needs that movement because within that joint, there's there's fluid called synovial fluid that's rich in nourishment, um, rich in rich in nutrients that actually can help um, feed the ends of those joints. Um, and so movement is kind of the best thing. Um, and as we move on to the next slide here, this very bottom point, motion is lotion. That's something that we frequently say within our clinic to patients because they come in with this mindset of, of movement is bad. I have an arthritic joint. It hurts when I move it. Move it. Well, we try to work out of that and show you that movement actually a lot of times is what helps the joint feel better um, and is a very important thing. So if you learn anything today, it's remember that motion is lotion. Uh, most of the time, uh, a sore joint will, will feel better if you actually move it versus just sitting and resting it. Um, so what counts as physical activity and where do we start? And the biggest thing is here is just don't overthink it. Um, a lot of times we think, uh, you know, I, I'm not very physically active. I got to start by going to see a trainer and they're going to give me this massive uh, specific exercise packet, you know, that's going to tell me exactly what I have to do and, and, and limit what I can or can't do. And when we're just getting, when we're just talking about physical activity, you really don't have to overthink it. Anything, anything really counts. Um, so here's some kind of some exercises, and this is a, this is few of many. Um, on the left side, we kind of have some lower intensity things that might be good for, say, we have a very very sore joint and we want to limit the amount of, um, you know, pressure we're putting on it. Um, doing things like recumbent biking or cycling um, are great. They're really they don't put a lot of pressure on the knee or knees or hips. Um, aquatics and swimming are great exercises. The buoyancy of the water can actually help take some of the weight off of our joints and really help relieve some pain. Um, simple walking, stretching, balance training, really stuff that's not super high intense can be a great place to start for your bone and joint health. And then we move to the right side where there's some more intense things like hiking and trail running, plyometric exercises, you know, your exercise classes like your, your Zumba classes, stuff like that, where you're, you know, kind of bouncing around moving a lot. Resistance exercises and jogging are all great activities to promote bone and joint health. You just have to make sure that you're at the right uh, right stage to to do those. Okay. So how much exercise do we need? Well, this is straight from the CDC again, um, and what they recommend is at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. And again, don't overthink this. This can be anything that really elevates your heart rate. Okay. If you see in the pictures in the bottom, the middle one is simply walking a pet. That gets your heart rate up, it gets you moving, it makes your joints move. The far right picture there in that, on the on the 150 minutes a week side shows gardening. Again, something that's not, it's not like you have to go to a gym and spend an hour and a half in a gym. Just getting out and moving and kind of doing your day-to-day -day tasks counts as, as some activity for you, okay? And then we look at the right side, muscle strengthening activity. So this is a lot of your resistance types work, like doing a formal exercise program or going for a, you know, a, a higher intensity jog, stuff like that. And they recommend doing that at least two days a week. Um, all right, perfect. So where do we come into play? So we come into play frequently when a patient's gone in and seen their position and they all of a sudden have a sore joint. Uh, again, what, what joint that is, it can, it can really be any of them. We, we tend to see almost anything. Um, but what we do is a lot of times we'll help develop and implement a home exercise program for you that is specific to where you're hurting and what is involved. So if you have true joint pain or, or really pain anywhere, it's important to get in and, and break down what the actual cause of that is. Not everybody's gonna fit the perfect mold of, uh, of just one blank exercise program, okay? Not every exercise is, is every person going to respond the same to. So it's important that we dive in and see what is the actual problem. 
what tissues are, are causing the issue and what do we need to do to address them, okay? Um, so with that being said, um, now say we're just looking into we want to become more active, we want to get moving, we know that it's important for our joints and bones. Well, what I've kind of thrown here at the end of this is just a daily um, maintenance program for bone and joint health. Now, again, if, if you're having specific joint pain, I would recommend that you actually get in and see, see a therapist, see a provider um, to, to more specifically focus what the issue is versus just running through this daily maintenance program. But this is a great place to start if we're just looking at increasing our, our mobility. So what exactly is this? Well, think of what we do every day that's part of our normal routine. You know, we get out of bed, we want to brush our teeth, we want to comb our hair, we want to bathe, we want to put on deodorant, we need to eat, sleep, we need to drink water. And those are things that we just do on a day-to-day -day routine and they're important for our body. But I want you to think of this movement as, as similar to this. You know, our, our joints and bones greatly need a daily maintenance program as well. Again, think of the, if you don't use it, you, you lose it thing. And as well as the uh, motion is lotion. You know, it's important to keep things moving, okay? So I'm just gonna run through a few exercises here that are really just whole body exercises that help kind of loosen things up and keep our joints moving freely, okay? So the first one here, we're, the first two here actually, we're looking at our spinal mobility, okay? So this top one here is what you're doing is you're just lying on your back, thinking of your knees as basically a windshield wiper and you're just letting them rock side to side while you keep, the, while you keep your shoulders and back flat on the mat. What this, doing, what this is doing is this is stretching out your hips and your lumbar spine or your low back. The next one, we're moving up the spine and we're working more into the, the thoracic spine or the spine area between your shoulder blades. Um, and so now you're letting your hips and knees stay in one place while your arm is rocking back and forth like a windshield wiper. Um, and you'll really feel a good stretch through your thoracic spine. Next, we'll move to a sitting position. And this first one at the top here, number three, a seated hamstring stretch. Almost all of us have tight hamstrings. Very rarely do I find a patient that doesn't have tight hamstrings. And quite frequently, this can result in, in back pain, hip pain, stuff like that down the road. So, so maintaining this mobility is important. Um, so this one, what you do is you kind of scoot to the edge of the chair, like this female is. Um, she straightens her right leg out. She pulls her right toe up, and then she just leans her trunk forward. By doing this, she's putting her hamstring on stretch, and you'll be surprised at how much of a stretch you actually get in this simple position. <clears throat> Number four, we're doing a seated trunk rotation. So this is working on our low back, kind of stretching out our spine, making sure everything is free moving there. Number five is lumbar flexion stretch. All right, how long do you, how long do you recommend doing each of these stretches for? Oh, I apologize, that's a great question. Um, so especially, um, and I think we can get a copy of these sent out, or I can at least put together a form that will give you direct access to all of these exercises. Um, but so these trunk rotations on these first ones, so these are just more, I would say do about three sets of 10 of each of these. And these are just nice and slow. You're rocking side to side, feeling the stretch each time. I don't want these to be a fast paced, bust through them, um, you know, high intensity exercise. This is feel good, get things moving, both of these two. Now, as we move to the seated hamstring stretch, I recommend this one you hold for a little bit longer. So I would say do about three sets of 30 seconds on each leg. And that's because when we're stretching something, um, we really need a prolonged stretch of about 20 to 30 seconds to actually get muscle lengthening. So we wanna hold number three a little bit longer, hold that stretch. Um, four and five, now with those, um, those you can do as more of kind of a rhythm stretch where you're kind of slowly rotating to the left, slowly rotating to the right and doing that about three sets of 10 times as well. Just kind of feel good getting things loosened up. Um, and that's same with number five and that, that lumbar flexion stretch is just going to stretch out the paraspinal muscles, which run all along your spinal cord and can help, um, help keep things moving. Um, if they get super tight, we tend to have a lot of pain and a lot of tightness in the back. Um, number six here, this is called a piriformis stretch. Now, piriformis stretch is an interesting little muscle that runs from our, basically our tailbone or the bone right above our tailbone um, called the sacrum. And it runs out to our, uh, the greater trochanter of our femur or our hip. Um, and why this muscle is important, a lot of you have probably heard of the condition called sciatica. 
Well, that's this is kind of the culprit for that uh, for that issue. If your piriformis gets um, super tight, irritated, it can compress on your sciatic nerve and can cause pain that kind of radiates all the way down the back of your leg. So in this position, you're going to cross one foot over top of your other knee. You're going to pull it up towards your chest and you'll feel a really good stretch kind of back here along the back side of your bottom is where you'll feel that stretch at. Um, again, this one here being more of a muscle stretch, I want you to hold this one for about 30 seconds. Next one, we're going to move to some lower extremity exercises. So now we're going to do just a standing mini squat. And really all this is doing is working on um, kind of a functional movement pattern. The biggest thing that I want you to do with a mini squat is to make sure that we're bending at the knees and the hips. Okay and not through the back. We want our back to keep in this nice flat position the whole time and bend through the hips and knees. If we don't have good um, mobility through our legs and our hips, what happens is we actually end up getting a little arch in our back and that can actually cause more damage to our back. So we wanna make sure we're bending at the knees and hips for the mini squats. That one again, shoot for about three sets of 10. These next two here, so a standing lunge, okay? Working on some hip and core stability with the lunge three sets of 10 on these standing lunges. And I normally recommend that you alternate. So the, this gal here is stepping forward with her right foot going into a lunge, bring that foot, foot back and then step forward with the left foot and kind of work through those. Number nine is a calf stretch. <clears throat> and so this gentleman here um, in this picture, he's actually stretching his left calf, okay? Um, and your thought here is that you stand about two to three feet from the wall um, extend your back foot back a little further and then push into the wall leaning forward with your hips, okay? And with this, I want you to try to do it with both this back knee straight and then the back knee bent a little bit. And what'll happen is as you bend the back knee, you'll feel the stretch a little bit lower in the calf. That's in the area of the soleus muscle. If you, if you stretch with the knee straight, it'll be up here towards the top of the calf, and that'll be the gastrocnemius muscle. They're just two different calf muscles that are both important to stretch. Um, again, this one here, we wanna hold for about 30 seconds each as we're shooting for a, a good stretch and muscle elongation. Um, so those ones are kind of the, the, the main exercises I gave you. Um, they're just a, a pretty simple set that kind of focus on general mobility, kind of getting everything moving, okay? Um, again, if, if we're dealing with specific joint pain, I would recommend coming in and getting a, a, a specialized program specifically for that area. And the last little thing here I want to talk about is a daily walking program, okay? Um, like that slide earlier talked about 150 minutes a day of, of activity that gets your heart rate up. For, for some of us, quite honest, most people, uh, a daily walking program will, will suffice for that. And the thing with this is that we don't have to complete the marathon on the first day, okay? Um, it's not like we gotta, we gotta jump in this and be like, all right, today I start walking, I'm gonna walk five miles today, and by next week I'm gonna be walking 12. That's not how this needs to work. We wanna ease into it, okay? And you kinda have to feel out your own individual body's ability to progress it. Um, if say you go out and walk three quarters of a mile one day, and the next day you're so sore and hurting so much that you can't get out of bed for two days, we've probably overdone it, okay? And you just have to cut back on that and find what works for you. And as a, as a therapist, it's not uncommon um, that we recommend patients start with as little as 10 minutes a day and to spread it out through the day. So sometimes I'll say take, you know, two five-minute walks a day and give yourself multiple hours in between. Again, we don't, have to, we don't have to complete the marathon on the first day. And then as just a general idea at the bottom, I said progress at most five minutes a week to allow your body to adjust. Um, and that's just, we want to make sure that our body's ready to take the next step and, uh, and progress to the next level. So in conclusion, um, so poor, poor bone and joint health um, can lead to adverse events such as bone fractures and potential joint replacements, okay? Um, maintaining a healthy diet plays a big role in maintaining our bone health. Staying active and moving daily is extremely important for bone and joint health. And a simple daily maintenance program can greatly improve our overall health and mobility. Um, and so with that, does, does anybody have any questions, any, any additional questions on what I said? I know I kind of went through it quickly, but I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of time to just to open up the, open up the questions. What are your recommendations to runners for protecting joints? Um, 
so running is a running is an interesting thing because obviously it's a great activity. It does a lot for the joints. Um, if you are able to run and aren't having that um, extended soreness or extend extreme knee pain, joint pain, stuff like that, um, you know, there's really I, I want you to limit yourself really depending on your amount of fatigue. Now, if we are running and we're having this knee pain this this joint pain stuff like that that's when i think it's it's most beneficial for patients to get an official um uh, running analysis and there's some really amazing things going on with this um, that we can do we can take you can use slow motion cameras um, we can break down each joint as it moves a lot of times what happens with runners um, especially if they're having knee pain they just have decreased knee control um, which is actually coming from muscles in the hip um, so it's really important just to feel yourself out with your running and decide, you know, if you're having pain, it definitely helps to get it looked at. Okay. And it can be as simple as, um, as a better pair of fitting shoes. Some of us have, um, less flexible ankles, um, that can be putting our joints in, in, uh, poor alignment, stuff like that. It's it, a shoe is really important for runners as well. Um, so I would just say if, if it, something is bothering you, jump in and get it checked out. Cause a lot of times it doesn't take a whole lot to, to sift out what the actual problem is with that. Um, and then I think I had another question on walking and asked if, if we recommended walking up to 100, 150 minutes a week. Um, and that, again, it doesn't have to be walking. That 150 minutes a week, that could be as simple as um, jumping on a, on a recumbent bike and going for a, a, a stationary bike ride. That can be as simple as, you know, going outside and doing some gardening work. Um, that can be as simple as, um, you know, going and playing with your grandkids in the park. It doesn't have to be strictly walking. It's just 150 minutes of getting your heart rate up, um, kind of pushing you outside of your normal limits. Right. Any other questions anybody have? Feel free to to mic in or just text them my way. Okay. So I see the one here with yoga or tai chi. Um, you know, in regards to the two of them, I'm not going to say one is better than the other. Um, I will say tai chi for the most part is a less um, intense and challenging type activity. Um, tai Chi does a lot with just natural flow movements of the body uh, and a lot more easy positions. Now you can do the same thing in yoga, but yoga tends to progress a little more quickly. They're both phenomenal activities for joint mobility, especially. Um, I, I've tried to do yoga a couple of times and the amount of flexibility you have to have for that is absolutely amazing. So the, both are both are great. Great for that. Let's see if I missed any other questions. Right. I think those are all the ones I've seen so far. All right, and I'll stay on a couple more minutes if anybody has anything else. Um, in regards to the turmeric as well, um, I, I've read a little bit on this as well. However, the, I, I believe from what I've read, the evidence is still not 100% sure on what, what that shows. Um, a, a lot of times with these supplements, if if people take them and they feel like it's helping them and it's it's causing some if it's if it's helping their pain, I'm never going to tell them that it's wrong to take. Now, again, in regards to specifics of it, um, again, I would I would recommend consulting a, a a dietitian or somebody who actually has more specific knowledge and and has dove in on those more. So, again, I apologize with my with the uh, you know knowledge of the medications and stuff like that, but that's. That's a different approach.
um, is running good for knees. Running is great for knees, and and I don't want to I don't don't want this to come off that running is bad for knees. Um, running running is a great full body workout. The only thing that I, I, I want you to caution on with running for your knees, if you are having knee pain, it kind of goes back to, to what is good uh, joint health. If you're having pain with running in your knees, you're likely, there's something probably tweaked in the, in the chain um, and it needs to be looked at and addressed. Because over time, now if you run um, and are, are really straining your knees um, and you're just fighting through pain, you can cause uh, long-term damage to the knee if the mechanics are off. So running itself is not bad for the knees. Running incorrectly or running through uh, a pain can be bad for the knees. And clicking or popping in the knees, that's frequently something we hear as well. We hear that with all joints. Um, patients come in and they say, you know, my, my knee pops every time I go up and down stairs. You know, is it arthritis? What's going on? Um, and most of the time when I when I um, talk to patients about this, I ask them, is it painful? If it's if it's a painless popping, um, most likely it's just a tendon rolling or a ligament um, rolling over bone in the joint, nothing completely normal, nothing to worry about. Um, if you're getting painful clicking or popping in the knees, um, especially a feeling of it locking, that's something that I would get looked at because that could potentially be a meniscus involvement. But if it's not painful, if it's not limiting, if it's not catching, then painful and clicking is, it's kind of part of the normal joint movements because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, is treadmill better than walking, running outside? I've heard it both ways, so I've been wondering. Um, so in regards to working your actual muscles, walking or running outside is actually better for you. And the reason for that is, is you actually have to use your glute muscles and your hamstrings when you're on non-moving ground like concrete or, or what have you walking outside. Um, a treadmill actually, because it's a belt that's moving underneath of you, what actually happens is you don't have to use your hamstring and glutes as much. Um, so I think uh, outside walking over ground is, is a little bit better than treadmill. However, I understand we live in Utah. It's, it's, you're not gonna be able to go outside and walk all the time. A treadmill is an absolutely phenomenal substitute for that. So don't, don't, don't take it that treadmill is bad. It's just, I think if you can get outside, it's a little bit better. <clears throat> yeah, and again, you know, like the colloidal silver, it's I, I, I wish I, I wish I could tell you guys more about, you know, the supplements and, and stuff like that, but it's just the the research really isn't there to show, you know, how effective it actually is. Um, but again, at the same time, like I said, if you found something that works for you, if you found something that you feel like makes the, the, the pain better, it makes you move uh, better with less pain, I, I'm not going to be the one to tell you that you shouldn't take that or use that. Um, because, it, you know, you know what you're feeling. So, um, yeah, I, sorry, I don't have a great response on the colloidal silver as well. Nobody else has anything. I'll probably probably stop the video unless anybody wants to shoot any last second questions. And I appreciate you guys all for for coming and listening. I know it seemed like a lot in a in a short period of time, but I hope you guys get a little feel a little more understanding of you know what you can do to help yourself out.
Clint, I don't know if you're still there, but this is Holly from the hospital. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation.